Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, the Bellator Fighting Championship, Extreme Cage Fight, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Tate, and we have a lot to talk about. We had quite a few events going on this past weekend. Uh, we're going to talk about that UFC 220 card that took place in Boston in which Steve Miocic defended his title against Francis Ngannou. Um uh, and how impressive he looked in his win. We're going to talk about Daniel Cormier and his defense of his light heavyweight title against Vulcan Ostermere. Uh, once again, Stipe and Daniel just looked amazing in their, their both of their title defenses. We're also going to talk about that Bellator 192 and the start of the Bellator Heavyweight Grand Prix uh, in the first in the first round event, uh, in which Chael Sonnen defeated Quentin Rampage Jackson, and they also had a co-main event where Douglas Lima defended his welterweight title against the Red King Roy Mac uh, uh, Roy McDonald, uh, and Roy actually is now the new Bellator uh, welterweight champion. And the question I'm going to have is, is he the new face of Bellator MMA? And then we're going to wrap things up in the final segment, which is the fourth segment, in which we're going to talk about that about that UFC press conference in which Dana, uh, Dana White and the UFC announced uh, the main event for UFC 220 and UFC 223, in which finally we're going to see Tony Ferguson versus Khabib Namanov. And yes, Khabib's name is so hard to say. Uh, and then uh, they also announced that Joanna Jojacek is actually going to get an immediate rematch and she's going to be getting another shot at the Women's Strawweight Championship against Thug Rose, Rose Namanunas. So. That's what we're going to cover today, and let's, so let's get started here. And we're going to start off by talking about uh, the heavyweight fight for UFC 220, the main event where Stipe Miocic actually dismantled Francis Ngannou. You know, a lot of people were really looking at this fight as a situation where there was going to be a coming out party for Francis Ngannou. And a lot of people were thinking this is the new uh, reincarnation of Mike Tyson. And Stipe was having nothing to do with that. Stipe had set the record for the most title defenses uh, by by stop, by stop beating Francis Ngannou. It seemed, I was about to say stop Francis Ngannou, but he didn't stop him. Francis uh, made it through the whole fight. But... Stipe just owned him pretty much from the first round. The first round, it was really hairy, you know, and, and you know, when you're, th when you're looking at this, you're, you're looking at Francis and you're just saying, man, he is just a beast of a man. And it's one of those things where it's like, can anyone stop him? So I was actually worried about Stipe when I, when I was looking at this, I I really like Stipe as a champion, but I just I I looked at it and I just said I just don't know how he's going to handle the power of Stipe. Uh, there was a lot of questions dealing with Francis Ngannou that hadn't been answered, uh, and the two biggest ones were the biggest factors in this fight. 
the biggest question, the question for Stipe was, could he take the power of Francis Ngannou? That was a big question on Stipe, but there was two main questions that rose uh, before this fight with Francis Ngannou. And that was number one, he had never, how is he going to handle if he gets taken down? And number two, no one had ever seen him really get out of like the first or second round. He's just been so dominant that no one had really taken him to deep waters. This is going to be his, this was going to be his first five round fight at a championship level. And he's fighting a guy that has world-class wrestling skills. It was going to be one of those tests. And quite frankly, as impressive as Francis Ngannou was, he failed that test. I think, uh, you know, you know, when you look at this and you see what, how it went down, it, when you, when you look at like control time in this fight, Stipe controlled Francis Ngannou for 15 straight minutes. When you look at, you know, look at how once, once Stipe took him down, Francis had a hard time getting back up. Uh, he didn't know how, it didn't seem like he knew how to defend himself. Uh, when he was on his back, Stipe ended up taking him down six times. And and the ground and pound was just devastating. When you look at total strikes, Stipe landed 240. Landed, uh, he threw 244, but he landed uh, 200 at an 82% clip. And as far as significant strike, power strikes, he landed 70, 70, like, you know, significant strikes. Francis had no answer for this. When you look at it, when you break it down by round, it was, a, it was a, you know, when you look at it and you just say, and round one was when Francis Ghana was at his most dangerous. That's when he threw most of his shots. Because Francis did not have much time. Uh, he got taken down twice in the first round. But he ended up throwing 18 strikes. Or landing 18 strikes. 15 of them were significant. So there was a point where Stipe had to weather the storm. He handled he handled the power and the pressure that Francis Ngano put on him really well. Um, but he was actually landing just as much as Francis Ngannou was uh, with throwing 24 strikes, 16 of them significant, plus two takedowns. He tro tr truly controlled him uh, for half of the fight, uh, for half of that round. When you rolled into the second round, I was kind of surprised at how winded uh, Francis Ngannou was by the beginning of the second round. By the second round, it was it was very obvious to me that Francis Ngannou had a stamina issue. And I think part of the reason why he had a stamina issue when you look at this fight, it was more about him trying to throw very hard, heavy shots in the first round. Uh, one of the things that Conor McGregor always talks about is being super efficient. Well, Francis Ngannou was not efficient. Uh, he was trying, he was loading up and he was trying to take Stipe out early in that first round. And when you do that, there's a there's a risk reward when you fight the way Francis Ngannou fights. There's a risk and reward. If you if you land, you got a short night, and that's kind of what happened with Alistair. It was a short night, power shot, bout took his head off, and it was over. But when you have when you adopt that style, you burn out. You 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 burn hot, and then you burn out. And that was, you could tell that was Stipe's game plan to take him into deep waters and drown him. And by, by midway through the second round, this fight was over in my eyes. Um, I did not think that there was any way that Francis Gano could even re remount, like amount any type of attack. Uh, the second round, I was clearly a Stipe round by round three. Uh, round three was just a rough day for Francis Gano. Uh, Stipe took him down, controlled him for over three minutes in the fight. 
Uh, he landed uh, 12 significant strikes, 47 strikes total. Uh, Francis Ngannou only landed one significant strike at that point. He was in deep trouble and he hadn't even made it to the championship rounds, but he was in deep, deep trouble. Uh, rolled into the fourth round and you look at this and this is the round in, in the fourth round where I thought, you know, if there was ever a situation to stop this, a chance to stop this, this, this fight, this was the round. Francis Gano had no answer. Uh, Stipe controlled him. He took him down and he controlled him for over four minutes of a five minute round. He threw, he threw 95 shots onto, on Francis Gano, landed 82, 18 were major significant strikes. And when you look at Francis Ngano, he threw three shots, landed zero. He did not in the fourth round. He was just, he was like a zombie walking out there. He was just exhausted. He didn't land anything. He was in trouble. Rolled into the fifth round and you look at this and you're, and this is the round where he, he tried, he tried to muster up more energy, but it was over. Uh, the game plan that, that, that Stevie had put together had just had worked. It was a, it was a masterpiece. Uh, he controlled in the fifth round. Stipe controlled him for uh, two, two, over two minutes. He threw 21 shots, 18 landed, seven of them with significant strikes. And Francis Ngannou, who actually did land a, a big shot uh, in that fifth round, that was the only major shot that he landed. Uh, but at that point, he was just too gassed and he had just had no answer for uh, Stephen Mayosha and his game plan. In the end, the judges, uh, the judges scored it five rounds to none. I scored it five rounds to none. Um, matter of fact, I, I, I scored, uh, a couple of rounds as a, as a 10 8 round. It was that lopsided. Uh, and you know, when you look at this fight and you see how impressive this was, um, and the fact that he had set the record for most title defenses, you look at this and you, and the question that comes up is, is Stipe Miocic the greatest UFC heavyweight champion of all time? And a lot of people were saying, yes, he is. Um, when you look and you say, you know, three title offenses gets you the record. It's not that impressive. But when you look at with the heavyweight division, the fact that no one has ever had, had defended the title that many times uh, shows you how dangerous that division is. You can win the title, but it is very hard to hold on to it. And Stipe has done that. Uh, do I look at him as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time or the greatest? Some people were even saying the greatest heavyweight of all time. I don't look at him as the greatest heavyweight of all time. I still give that to Fedor is my number one. Um, Fabricio is number two. And then I would give it, then I would put Stipe and Kane tied uh, as far as greatest heavyweights. And that's, that's, in the, the, you know, using, looking at all organizations. But when you're talking about UFC heavyweight champions, uh, I think you have to just look at, is it, is it really Stipe or Kane? And the fact of the matter is Kane did not whether it was, you know, a bad night with Fabricio uh, at high altitude, which was a bad decision, was which was a, a bad situation for Kane. And so he lost the title. So when you look at UFC heavyweight champions, I may not make Stipe the greatest heavyweight of all time, but I, I, you, you can't argue with the stats that he has defended the title more times than anyone else. So, you know, I can understand where people would say he's the greatest UFC heavyweight champion of all time. Uh, with Francis Ngannou, when you look at what's next for Francis Ngannou, and a lot of people are talking about him fighting the Black Beast next. I personally think the best, after watching this fight, he's a young guy. The best decision that I think he could make is I would take the rest of the year off. And I know you when you hear like it's January and you're saying take the rest of the year off of your Francis Ngannou. 
I say yes. That's exactly what I say. Is because Francis Ngannou was exposed. He is an impressive fighter. This guy has a bright future ahead of him. But now Stipe has laid out the, the blueprint to how to beat him. Take him down. Wear him out. Take him to deep water and drown him. Uh, he has his 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 ground skills are very subpar. And the fact is, he's only been doing this for four years. So this guy has lots of upside. But the reason why I say he shouldn't take another fight the rest of the year or at least take an extended period of time off, he needs to get into the gym and work on his on his wrestling and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he needs to work on it a lot uh, because he's going to be in big trouble. If you, if you put him in the, in the, in the ring with like a Fabricio or Kane or anyone else that is, that's high level. He's, if, if he doesn't get him out in the first round and land that big bomb, it's over for him. Uh, that's why, you know, when you start looking at what's next for him, if you're talking about fights, you're looking at a Mark hunt, or Black Beast as far as opponents. I don't like that one. I think he'd be better served going to, you know, working on his wrestling, working on his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. A place that I think would be a perfect place for him would to go to AKA. Uh, but I, you know, AKA has Kane and I don't think they're really looking to cross and have uh, two heavyweights in their stable. But a gym like that, that is very strong, very high wrestling IQ, uh, AKA team alpha male, someone like that, that's going to really help him work with wrestling. He has to do that in order to advance. If he gets his wrestling and, and his grand being able to operate off his back, if he gets that together, then I think he can still make a title run. Um, I just say he, he was rushed a little too fast. He, he came to the party just a little too fast this time. And I don't fault the UFC for putting him in that situation because he had deserved it. He had annihilated everyone he had fought. He had, he annihilated one of the, one of the top contenders in the division and Alistair Overeem and he deserved his title shot, but it was just a little too soon. Take time off, get your wrestling together, come back. Bigger, badder, stronger. Now, Stipe, uh, as they're talking about Stipe, and not only are they talking about is he the greatest heavyweight of all time, but everyone's saying what's next. And one of the things that surprised me was that everyone, when you talk about what's next for him, uh, you know, everyone talked about they brought up Fabricio. Uh, Cain Velasquez was brought up as well as an, as a possible opponent for him. Uh, but during the press conference, uh, Dana surprised me because what he said, who he thinks should be next is Daniel Cormier. And that was a big shocker for me. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next for Stipe. When we come back, speaking of Daniel Cormier, when we come back, we're going to talk about that Daniel Cormier fight against Vulcan Olsamir and how what's going to be next for him. And then maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that possible Stipe uh, Daniel Cormier fight. When you when we come back, we'll cover that. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. (laughs) 
All right, we're back. And in the last segment, we were talking about UFC 220 and the main event where Stipe Miocic just dominated in defending his title against Francis Ngannou and how impressive he was. And when we ended things, we were kind of, we were talking about how I was very surprised in the press conference when everyone was talking about what's next for Stipe Miocic. And Dana White said the fight, or the fight he would want, like to see is Daniel Cormier. And that rolls us right into what we're talking about here, the co-main event at this event here. Which which had Daniel Cormier versus Vulcan Olsamir. and you know it's kind of weird when you look at the Stipe Miocic fight versus Francis Ngannou, and then Daniel Cormier versus Vulcan. It had two really two veteran champions defending their titles against two very strong, powerful upstarts who had been knocking out you know everyone that stepped in the ring with them. But the surprising thing that happened in these fights was that both of these guys, Francis Ngannou and Vulcan, really had no answer to the veterans in this fight. And this is one of those situations where Daniel Cormier made me think about back when, you know, when I was a kid. And I was a pretty good basketball player when I was a kid. Uh, and one of the things that used to always bug me was when I when I was younger, I would play basketball with my dad. I'd be, I'd go to the park and I'd play basketball with my friends and I'd just dominate. And I'd be I'd be so impressive and I'd be so I just thought I was the man. And then I'd come home or hang around the house and one day my dad and I would play uh, play basketball and he would beat me every single time. And it would always bug me. But my dad would always have those old man tricks. He'd grab your jersey a little bit. He'd, he'd rough you up a little bit. He was just always, he always had little tricks on how to slow you down that other, that your, your friends at your age didn't have those tricks. Well, that's what this fight reminded me of. Daniel had all the old man tricks on how to control Vulcan. Vulcan uh, came in with one game plan. I'm going to knock him out. And he realized very early on he was not going to knock Daniel Cormier out. Daniel had a game plan. Daniel, not only the thing that was surprising, not only could Daniel uh, handle the pressure that Vulcan was putting on him, but he could actually, at some point, I actually thought he was out striking him. Uh, when you look at the fight as a whole and total total strikes and everything, you, you look at this, you look at this fight and Daniel just control to me, Daniel controlled it from 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 start to finish. Uh, the fight was ended up being stopped. But when you in the second round, but when you look at it in the first round of uh, you know, Vulcan came out and guns are blazing. He threw a lot of shots early on. He threw 83 shots, uh, landed 41, 37 significant strikes because he came in with the game plan that he was going to knock Daniel out in the first round. And he really believed that uh, Daniel was much more efficient. Where Vulcan was landing, and, and Vulcan landed about a forty-nine percent clip. Uh, Daniel landed at a fifty-two percent clip, throwing fifty-six punches. Uh, twenty-nine threw fifty-six, landed twenty-nine. Twenty-seven of those were significant strikes. But the big thing that really got Vulcan in trouble was that was that takedown. Once Daniel got him on the ground, Vulcan had no answer. I repeat, Vulcan had no answer. Daniel took him down. He roughed him up. Uh, and this was, I mean, it was just a brutal, brutal situation. Uh, barely, he barely got out of, Vulcan barely got out of the first round. Uh, pretty much, I would just say, got saved by the bell. Uh, in the second round, uh, Daniel, Daniel took him Daniel took him down. 
he controlled him. He put him in a crawl and, uh, and, uh, I was going to say crossbow, but it wasn't, uh, I can't think what it's called right now. Uh, but he had him down, had him stretched out. He had, he had no defense and Daniel was just pounding him, uh, through 57 in, in that round through 57 shots landed 55 of them. And, and Vulcan was just getting just annihilated. Eventually the referee had to step in and save him, uh, at three minutes in the second round. It was just too much. It Vulcan, I mean, it was just way too much Daniel, uh, for Vulcan or Samir. Uh, it was just an, it was just an impressive showing. As a matter of fact, I would say to me, this was the most impressive I'd ever seen Daniel. Daniel's always looked impressive. But you could tell he had something to prove. And then afterwards, when you listen to the press conference and you listen to him kind of say that he felt like this was his, you know, he had to show he like he felt like he had to show he was champ. That now he feels like he's now champ again uh, because the title was just kind of given to him after he lost the dance after he got knocked out by John Jones. Uh, and so the one thing I would say you can tell that if I was going to give some advice to Daniel, put that, put that John Jones situation behind you and move on. I know that they had the John Jones came out with, he did a polygraph and showed that, that he did not intentionally take any performance enhancing drugs or anything like that. And I don't know if he's good, Daniel, if, uh, if John Jones is going to get suspended, but it's time for Daniel to move on uh, and just put this behind him. He was so impressive. And you look around and you say, what's next for Daniel Cormier? The first thing is he announced that March of 2019 will be his last fight. He will not fight after next year, the beginning of next year. So he has a year. He's going to fight for about a year and then he's going to retire. That's the first thing. And that always worries me when it comes to a fighter. When you give a significant date, a, a, a steadfast date of when you're done, once you start thinking about retirement, that's a very scary thing because when you got, you can't be a fighter with one foot in and one foot out. So the fact, but he did, he did announce that this is, this is his last year and March is be March, uh, 2019 will be the end of his career. Uh, and he has a lot to go, a lot, a lot going on. Also, when you start looking at what's next for him, when you, when you look around and you say Jimmy Manawa, Manawa as a possible title contender, uh, you know, but Jimmy Manawa just got, he got stopped by Vulcan. Uh, so the most logical one you would think would be Alexander Gustafson, someone that he already fought a spectacular fight. But Gufferson's injured, injured. So it goes right back to what we were talking about before. Is this the moment where uh, where Daniel Cormier is going to have is going to go back up to the heavyweight division and take on Stipe Miocic? One of the things I'll tell you is the fact that Daniel that uh, Dana White has said that's the fight he would like to see. I think this fight is going to happen. Uh, Cain Velasquez wondered, and Daniel really didn't want to talk about that because he just said that Cain is back in the gym and he's coming back and he, you know, and they don't, they never want to be fighting in the same division. They don't want to, Daniel doesn't want to hold the title up or anything away, take an opportunity away from Cain. But this is the reason why I say this is the perfect fight. Uh, and I was against this originally. And originally the reason why I was against this, against this is because you have a situation where there's already too many, there's this whole interim championship thing. I hate that. Conor McGregor's held up a title for over almost going on uh, over a year, going on two years. And then with George St. Pierre, just dropping another title and tying up another title, having the heavyweight and the light heavyweight title tied up between with one person, is a bad situation, but this is the exception to the rule. This is a true super fight. Never has the heavy, you know, you, you're going to have the heavyweight champion versus the light heavyweight champion going at it. Two dominant fighters. 
when you look at the light heavyweight championship, the greatest, the greatest of all time is John Jones. But there's a, there's a red flag. He's been, he's been, he's been, uh, he, you know, hit with a couple of, a few PED, uh, allegations against him. And so if you're someone that eliminates John Jones is the greatest light heavyweight of all time, then it is a clear picture. If you eliminate John Jones because of the PED uh, allegations, then Daniel Cormier is the greatest light heavyweight champion of all time. Or if you do count John Jones in, Daniel Cormier is the second greatest light heavyweight champion of all time. And then you mix in the fact that Daniel has been fighting at heavyweight and there was never ever anyone that could stop Daniel. Daniel was an undefeated light heavyweight. I mean, not sorry, light heavyweight. He was an undefeated heavyweight. He fought he fought in the strike force, he fought he fought in the UFC, and no one has ever been able to figure out Daniel at the heavyweight division. He's a smaller heavyweight, but he is a tough heavyweight. And so that's the reason why I do see this fight actually happening. For Daniel and Kane Kane is just getting back uh, from injury. He's been out of the picture for a while. I don't see Kane getting an immediate title picture, getting a, getting an immediate title shot. I think if if it's not Daniel, it would be Fabricio, uh, and that Kane would have to fight someone else. So that's the reason why I say Daniel was a good is a good fit. Daniel could come in, he could fight for the heavyweight title. Uh. And by the time it's time for Kane to get ready to fight for the title again, Daniel's already thinking about retirement. Uh, so I think it's a good, it's now is the time to do this. I really like this, uh, this uh, opportunity. Now with Vulcan, what's next for Vulcan? Uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, Vulcan takes a major step back. I'm not sure where you put him right now, but I tell you this. Just like Francis Ngannou, he needs to take some time and get his wrestling skills together. Uh, Daniel really exposed him and showed how to beat Vulcan. Vulcan has to work on his wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu before he starts thinking about getting back in the ring again. Both of these guys, I personally think, should take some extended time off to round out their game. They're both young enough that both of these guys have the potential, potential to be light heavyweight champion and heavyweight champion, but not until they round out their game and get their ground game together, the ground defense together uh, so that they can make, you know, make a run because you cannot, you cannot get annihilated like the way these two guys have gotten. They both got annihilated. Uh, so with that, uh, that's pretty much all I can say. I can't think of anything anywhere else I would put Vulcan uh, anyone else I would if I was if I was managing Vulcan, it would just be take some time. Get your ground game together, your your defense together and then come back. Daniel, I'm all on board with especially with the light heavyweight division being already cleaned out. Daniel, Daniel and John Jones have pretty much cleaned out that that light heavyweight division now. Uh you know, with Daniel, do you give him Jimmy Manawa? And I say no. So it's it's the Stipe fight. I I'm I'm going to stick my neck out there and I'll say that Stipe fight's going to happen. When we come back, we're going to go on break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about that Bellator uh, event that pa that's this past Friday, uh, Bellator 192, and the start of the heavyweight Grand Prix. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. All right, we're back, and 
we were just recapping that UFC 220 card. We talked about the main event. Stipe Miocic keeping his title, winning the he keeping the heavyweight title, and stopping Francis Ngannou. Uh, pretty much a, a dominant performance by Stipe, winning all five rounds, and then Daniel Cormier defending his light heavyweight title against uh, Volkan Oshimir in a lights out performance, dominating Volkan and stopping him in the second round. And now we're going to talk about Bellator. Bellator 192 and the start of the Bellator Heavyweight Grand Prix. Uh, that was this weekend as well. Um, a bit of a surprise you had. It was it was Chael Sonnen versus Quentin Rampage Jackson. And Chael won, uh, won that on all scorecards 29-28. Uh, my takeaway on this is this. Chael Sonnen is a blown up middleweight fighting heavyweight. And he was fighting Rampage Jackson, a light heavyweight for most of his career. I thought Chael put together a really great game plan. Being the smaller, quicker fighter, uh, he used that to his advantage. The one thing that I took away from this is that Rampage, the last two times I've seen Rampage fight, he's fought at heavyweight. And he just doesn't look good as a heavyweight. He, I, I really feel like Rampage has to start working on his cardio. He's at the, he's at the, is, he's at the tail end of his career. And I don't know if it's just oh, just Father Time has caught him, or he's fighting at a weight class that he just shouldn't be at. And I and I think it's a little bit of both. But if Clinton, if Quentin plans on continuing the fight, he needs to get back down to that light heavyweight division. He's just too slow, too predictable at that at that weight class. He wants to swing for the fences. His timing's off. He's a lot slower. And like King Mo and Chell, you're able to time him. Throw the big punch, tie him up, and he doesn't have enough energy when he gets when he gets behind. He doesn't have enough energy or enough speed to actually come back once he gets in a hole. So the key with Rampage is not get caught with a big shot, get out to a big lead, wear him down, and you'll run away with the fight. And that's not that's not the rampage that I'm used to seeing. So he really has to do something uh, to improve here. Uh, Chell, Chell looked good. Um, I still, when I look at Chell for this, he's gonna be moving on, and he's gonna be fighting the winner of Frank Mir versus Fedor. Fedor is the most optimal p opponent for Chell because Frank Mir is just so much bigger. Even Fedor is going to be a much larger man. Uh, the I just see Chell just being, I worry that Chell is going to be just way too small to make a major impact against those two guys, uh, the winner of those two guys. But he looked really good. Chell is moving on. I, I love the interview. Uh, with Big John Mc, uh, McCarthy and him in the ring. Also, it was the debut of Big John McCarthy in the ring. That's going to take some getting used to to see Big John McCarthy, not as the referee, but as a show, you know, on air personality interviewing fighters in the ring. He seemed a little rusty, not not necessarily rusty, but you know, working out the kinks here. But it's still kind of hard for me to, to to take that in. But uh, it, Chell was in rare form in the ring. Uh, enjoyed that. So it's on, and you know, so Chell Sonnen is is moving on. Also on this card, you also had the co-main event, which uh, which we were looking forward to seeing. The co-main event was. Douglas Lima, the waterweight champion against Roy Mac uh, McDonald. 
And uh, this was a fight that originally was supposed to be the main event, and then Bellator changed it to the co-main event. And I think they made the right decision. It should have been that way from the beginning uh, because, uh, you know, more people, I think I was I was looking for more to the heavyweight Grand Prix than the main event, but the, the co-main event. But it did not disappoint. Douglas Lima, who is truly, truly one of the best Water weights in the world against Roy McDonald, which is is considered one of the top five heavy I mean Walter weights in the world, and that's the that's the question that comes up. Roy wins this in a unanimous decision, pretty much from pretty much early on. Lima with leg kicks had put, kicks had put a huge hematoma on uh, Roy McIlroy's leg, McDonald's leg. He was not uh, at one point. I don't think he could even put weight on his leg. So, without without being able to stand, Roy McDonald actually put together a game plan of taking Lima down, grinding him out, ground and pound, so that he can control the fight. And he fought that way. He couldn't even walk out of the ring afterwards. But even on one leg, he was able to win the water rate title. And the question, the statement that came out after this was that Bellator finally has a champion that is actually better than the UFC champion. And that was, that was the statement going around. And I disagree. And the reason why they say that is Roy McDonald beat Tyron Woodley uh, many years ago. Uh, and so they're saying because Tyrone, Tyrone, because Tyrone Willie lost to Roy McDonald, Roy McDonald was actually a better fighter than Tyrone Woodley. Fights happen at different times in a fighter's career. I would say even if you look at Tyrone Woodley three, four years ago, I think Tyrone is a better fighter today than when they fought the first, when they, Roy and, uh, and Tyron fought the first time. So I don't necessarily say that Roy is the better fighter. When you look around and you say in that time, Roy lost to Robbie Lawler and he lost to uh, Wonder Boy in which Tyron beat both of those guys. So I, even though you say head to head, Roy beat Tyron, that was some time ago. But when you look at common opponents, uh, Tyron Woodley is actually has actually beat both of those guys. I would still say that Tyron Woodley is the better fighter and is ranked higher. I have a lot of respect for for what Roy Roy uh, McDonald has done in the ring. I think he should be the face of Bellator. Uh, I think the Bellator should really get behind him. He's he's really truly the first big free agent who has come over to Bellator who has actually panned out. Most of the fighters that have come over from the UFC to Bellator has hit a speed bump and has struggled. Uh, and so Roy is the first one to really come over, look impressive. And and should be the guy that they're going to get behind. And, uh, you know, I really hope that happens. With that being said, though, you look at you look at things. The, the biggest question that I had is how well would this fight do? Especially since the fact that Bellator 192 was up was head to head against the UFC. Uh, this card did actually very well, had over a million views. So it did great against the UFC. It didn't outperform the UFC. Uh, you know, they were just, you know, it had, it was, everyone could watch both of them. And it looks like a lot of people did just that, watch both fights. It also tells me, watching the very first round of that heavyweight Grand Prix, Bellator is on to something here. There's a lot of interest into this in this heavyweight grand prix and you and you had you picked the right fight to start off to kick things off by watching chell and rampage it got me fired up and ready for seeing big country fight uh seeing fedor seeing how frank mir is going to come back 
thinking about Ryan Bader versus versus King Mo. I'm actually after watching this, I am definitely interested in seeing what happens. I will definitely tune in and I think a lot of the audience is going to it's gonna it's gonna draw in more than just that hardcore MMA fan. I think this is going this heavyweight Grand Prix is going to draw in the casual fan. This is this is the perfect event to start off the year for Bellator. So I think they they did a good they did a good thing. They did a really smart thing by changing and making the heavyweight Grand Prix the main event. And so they're going to keep on doing this and they're going to ride that wave. I predict a big start to the beginning of the year for Bellator because of this. So when when looking at that, you know, and then also you also had Aaron Pico, which was their their star signing their 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 blue chip prospect who came in and, you know, Pico had came in with all the star with all the, you know, the the hype behind him. And he started out really rough getting stopped. But since then, he is he's been on a roll. He had a first round stoppage. This event is looking uh, is shaping up to be, uh, you mean not necessarily the event of the heavyweight Grand Prix is looking good. The prospect of Aaron Pico is looking good. Then you turn around and you say Roy McDonald, he's looking good. Bellator has something going here, and I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Okay, we're going to take our last break of the show. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about the press conference that was held this week in which the UFC and Dana White had made an announcement for UFC 222 and UFC 223, in which they made an announcement that it will not be Conor McGregor that will be defending his title, but instead... Khabib versus Tony Ferguson for the undisputed title. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. All right, we're back, and we just got done talking about the Bellator 192 event, uh, the heavyweight Grand Prix, the fact that Roy McDonald is now the new welterweight champion, and now we're going to talk about that uh, UFC press conference that was done this past Friday in which Dana White announced that there will be a fight between Tony Ferguson versus Khabib Nurmagomedov for not the interim light heavyweight championship, but the undisputed heavyweight championship. The only problem with this announcement, and I'm super excited about this fight because this is the fight that everyone's been wanting to see for a long time. The only problem I have with this is I think Dana's confused on what you call undisputed they made the announcement that the interim champion would be defending the title against Khabib Nurmagomedov and Dana said it's for the undisputed title but then when everyone asks are you stripping Conor McGregor of the lightweight title he did. He would not answer. He would not go out on the limb and say yes. He said it's for the it's for the it's for the lightweight title, the undisputed lightweight title. 
But when everyone asked, so you're stripping Conor McGregor? He said, no, I didn't say that. But this is for the undisputed title. The whole point and definition of an undisputed champion is there is no other champion. You can't have Conor McGregor as the lightweight champion and then say that Tony Ferguson versus Khabib Namanamanoff is the undisputed champion because then there is a dispute. Uh, that's my only problem with this. Super excited about seeing this fight. This is a fight that has been waiting to happen. When I look at this and I look at Khabib, Khabib has been a force of nature, has been going through and has been demolishing everyone he, you put in front of him. El Kakui, Tony Ferguson has been just lights out. You have two unstoppable forces that are about to collide. And I really don't know. I'm still going back and forth on who I think is going to win. Right now, I'm still leaning toward Khabib because I do not see. I just don't see how I can. I can't picture Khabib losing. But then again, that same token, Tony Ferguson I can't really, it's hard for me to even picture Tony Ferguson losing. So I'm really looking forward to seeing UFC, the UFC 223. That's going to be the main event. Another announcement that the, that they made at this press conference, which I was super excited for, is the co-main event. They announced that Joanna Jocecek will get an immediate rematch against Thug Rose Namanunas. For the for the UFC Women Strawweight Championship, that will be the co-main event at UFC 223. This is a fight I am super looking forward to. Talk about unstoppable force! Up until the moment that Joanna ran into Rose, no one could figure out Joanna. No one, and when you couldn't even picture the concept of Joanna tapping because of strikes to anyone and Rose was able to do that. The question is, was that a fluke situation? Is is Rose really does Rose really have the recipe to stop the unstoppable force of Joanna Jojacek or was it a bad weight cut that really did affect uh Joanna Jojacek? Uh that's the one thing that everyone is going to be looking to see. Does Joanna come back to her regular form or has Rose figured her out? I'm, the, you know, when I, when you go back and it's kind of hindsight and you look and you, you find out how bad Joanna's weight cut was, uh, it definitely opens up some questions to see will you, you know, with a completely healthy Joanna, how will Rose do? I am a big fan of both of these ladies and I am super looking forward to this women's strawweight championship fight. I also want to say something about Joanna Jojacek. I have never seen anyone hold their high, their head so high after losing a title match or after losing any match. She has been everywhere carrying the Olympic torch. She's on Facebook. She's on Twitter. She's everywhere and she's having the time of her life just like she was when she was champion. She and Joanna is enjoying her life. She enjoyed her life as champion. She's enjoying her life outside of the ring as former champion. I really like what she's done. That shows a person that is super mentally tough. And a, and a mentally tough fighter is hard to beat. She's mentally tough in the ring. She's mentally tough outside the ring. That's what makes Joanna such a tough fighter to deal with. Uh, and then you look at Rose. Rose is riding high after uh, after this win. A lot of times it's a lot harder to be the champ instead of the hunter. This is one situation where she's going to have to come back and she's going to have to fight and and defend her title. I wish the UFC would do more of this. I think fighters, if you're a champ and you've been able to defend the title a couple times, I think all champions who who have won the title and has defended the title a couple times should always get an immediate rematch. I think that's a policy that the UFC should adapt. 
I really like this situation here. Watch it, looking at this fight. So super excited about that. And then the third announcement was, and in which everyone kind of knew, is that the featherweight champion uh, ship will be on the line where the champ, Max Holloway, will be defending his title against Frankie Edgar, and they will be headlining UFC 222. This is going to be, this is an interesting fight here too, because you look at the champ who has, and, and when I say champ, I look, you look at Max Holloway and the fighters that he's fought. Frankie Edgar is a different type of fighter. He's going to have that ground and pound. He's going to be able to take, you know, is, is he going to be able to take Max Holloway down and ride him out, use ground and pound to take care of him? This is the final hurdle for Max Holloway to see what kind of fighter he really is. Max has been lights out and has been impressive. This, in my opinion, could be the toughest test of his career. And I know a lot of people say, you know, what about the Conor McGregor fight? Wouldn't that be his toughest test of the year of his career? This is different. This is this is him defending the title. This is him at championship level. Frankie Eggers is is presenting a puzzle that we really hasn't seen someone with this level of ground game. Looking forward to seeing how Max Holloway handles this. He looks in the press conference. He looks super confident. He looks ready to go. This and I. This is going to be a great fight. And Frankie and Frankie has openly admit he thinks this is, is going to be his last shot at the title. So it's either all or nothing. I think Frankie's going to put it all out on the line. This is definitely worth seeing. This concludes this episode of the UFC of the of the GSMC MMA podcast. When we come back uh, on our, in a couple of days, we'll be recapping, not necessarily recapping, we will be talking about the up-and-coming fight between Derek Brunson and Jacare Sosa. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to, you can always follow us uh, on iTunes. Remember to subscribe and follow us. Always be willing to put on a, uh, a you know a review hopefully a nice review because that really helps us out if you enjoy the show and with that to all a good night you've been listening to the golden state media concepts mma podcast part of the golden state media concepts podcast network you can find this show and others like it at www gsmcpodcast.com Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.